How to get ready to crush your home league in 2024. We are releasing this, Sean, on the 29th of August as we record this one. And people are reaching out. They're ready for their home league drafts that are happening this weekend. I know for a fact that I had one, you know, in the last week or so, and I know a lot of them like to draft closer to the season. I know the kind of ongoing meme is like, you know, when somebody gets injured, we say like, this is why I don't draft my fantasy football teams till October. But we are in a situation here where the season is one week away. People are excited. And Sean has had a couple of great articles up on Rotoviz over the last week, looking specifically at home leagues. And we have Kevin Safranik, who's done a couple of great articles as well, looking at some of the must draft running backs, wide receivers, and setting you up with a game plan with those. We have Sean talking about his 10 upside plays to crush your most important draft. And for a lot of people, Sean, those home leagues is all the bragging rights in the world, and they are the drafts you want to win. So as you get ready for this weekend, we are going to talk through some of the elements that maybe it is important to look out for. And for people who are, you know, regular listeners of Rotoviz OT, listening throughout the entire offseason, maybe it's a case that you're drafting in some of the big baseball contests and have been drafting all offseason or listening to us. But there is a, a big difference when it comes to those home leagues, those home league ADPs, the players that people are drafting or emphasizing. And that also means a little bit like when myself and Sean are doing the live drafts and we're trying to figure out the ADP and who may come back in the next round. That is something that you really want to play into in these home leagues as you will see all sorts of ADP shifts versus what we're seeing in those FFPC or underdog draft rooms. Sean, it is a very exciting weekend for people as they start to lock in those rosters. I want to wish everyone a lot of fun while they do that. But as people get ready for their fantasy football home league drafts and the final drafts off theirs before the start of the season. What are some of the, the opening thoughts that you have in terms of looking ahead to these drafts and maybe the differences in preparation versus when we're looking at baseball or you know different formats that are very volume based in the ADP is much different than we see in some of these home leagues. That's a great setup because home leagues are different. They are super important. Think about all of those times getting together with family, friends, college, buddies, roommates, coworkers. You think of the parties involved. You've got to be able to draft well. There's a lot of other influences. There's a lot of other <laughs> things going on. Yeah, well, well, other well, 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 other influences. You may be dealing with some distractions. As yeah, you try and fair. find the tag to go put up on the board to make your pick in a home league. Colin, I want to wish everyone a fantastic holiday weekend as you are spending time with family, traveling, everyone be safe. Make sure you work those fantasy drafts around the most important thing, which friends, family, but Colin, you got to then beat those people. So, you have to. What are the keys as we get into a home league? The first thing is understanding what is the same and what is different when you think through the content that we provided all off season. We think about the wide receiver avalanches. We think about all of the stacking elements. We think about zero running back. We think about leagues that require two QBs and... 10 or 11 starting spots. Bench home hockey. leagues. Yeah. I mean, home leagues have gotten extremely excited. You may play. Yeah. You may play in that type of home league, in which case you are ready. But Colin, there are a lot of leagues that aren't quite like that. And you wouldn't want to bring the same tactics to the table. No, you definitely wouldn't. Um, in terms of like, we always start off all these discussions with the format, the flex spots, the starting wide receiver allocation, the starting running back allocation. Is it, PPR is a tight end premium for this conversation Sean will stick to the the PPR element of it I think because a lot of I, I do think a lot of home leagues now have gone from standard to PPR uh, in terms of their scoring Sean when we look into knowing let's say everyone knows their their format knows their strategy and their structure and I, I think most leagues are going to be at least two running backs two wide receivers one tight end and then flexes you might have some that are two then three wide receivers and then one tight end and then the flexes after that but 
Most of them, I think, are going to give you the ability to go with four wide receivers at minimum versus two running backs if you wanted to do that. When we look at one of the articles I mentioned already, Kevin has done is a fantastic look at trying to build a hero or zero running back roster and giving you some of the options as to how you would build that out with him looking at Yahoo Fantasy in terms of the overall ADP. And it, it paints a very different picture as to how you can do that between each round and trying to pick your names out of kind of that area. And it, it is a case that knowing the league settings, knowing how you can build it out, but also knowing your league mates. Because one of the things tends to show up when we look at you know, some of the highlighted players that Kevin has pointed out in his articles at the wide receiver position, for example, a lot of the times the rookie players that get dinged and not get dinged in terms of a negative way for you for drafting, but get dinged in terms of their ADP difference is much different. He highlights some of the, the names over there. For example, Xavier Worthy on Yahoo versus the FFPC, who is my, it could be my fault over at the FFPC. Sean is my highest drafted player, as I mentioned on another show, but 33 picks of a difference between a player like that. So there is a lot of players that will see big shifts in ADP. And rather than drafting him at where you would in your FFPC league, if you're drafting in that format, maybe letting him go a little bit later or a little bit further will allow you to do that. But the same with the running back position. And I would find it a lot with home leagues for the tight ends. With the younger tight ends in particular, Sam Laporta, maybe people are, oh yeah, that's Sam Laporta. He was really good you know, down the stretch last season. But I feel like the Trey McBride one is a question that I've gotten a few leagues where I've drafted with people who wouldn't be consistently kind of in the best ball bubble. And it's like, oh, you like you're you're really high on Trey McBride, you know, and it feels like I've waited a long time to pick him at that point. So I feel like rookies and tight ends are two areas where people value them extremely differently in home leagues. And Sean, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I feel like name cache, you know, players who have done it in the past i guess is another way to look at it they are they maintain their value a lot more in those home leagues because people aren't as much in the weeds potentially and they're seeing a name that they have seen in the past you know i'll take that guy he he usually he used to go in the second round we're now in the, the sixth round he i'll take him so i think you see things like that as well in your home leagues where you can kind of gain an edge from that perspective as well and one of the reasons that I think our PPR and half PPR advice will hold up regardless is that I am going to recommend that drafters hit the running back position differently in home leagues. I, I mentioned it on the show from time to time, my sister is the most dominant fantasy manager in our extended family. She wins her home league every year. And one of the things that you simply want to do to be successful is to address your starting lineup and address them with players who are basically not dead zone players that can sound either overly simplified to where it's not useful or too simple to be accurate but i think that neither of those things is really true in that we talk a lot on the show about the running back dead zone and in home leagues you should feel free to take any running back that you like at the prices that are being offered in your draft. You simply want to take good players. And if you do that, you will end up with enough running back depth that you don't have to get into the guys that we often are drafting on the show and thinking, well, who am I going to start? I don't want to deal with that. You know, our players going to get injured. I don't want to root for that. Again, we're not rooting for that ever. Certainly in a home league, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're watching on Sundays and having any of those types of feelings. You can get guys who are good. And so the big article that I put out, depending on when we release this, <laughs> but yesterday, the day before, what have you, focused on CBS. ADP. So we have articles out for CBS, for Yahoo, for ESPN. We've got you covered across the board. If you want to absolutely hammer your home league draft, make sure you have that Rotovis sub. Go through those articles. You will do well. The Discount thing, code RV Radio 2024 for 10% off. 10% off is almost free at that point, Colin, right? <laughs> Just the other 90% left. <laughs> You're going to. We're going to advertise it as 90% 
of the subscription you have to yeah. pay for if you yeah. use the code RV Radio 2024 at checkout. Call in home leagues, what I'm seeing here, Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson, top three picks. I think that makes sense, right? Lean yeah. into those guys, get your foundation running back. Jonathan Taylor drafted early. Kyron Williams drafted earlier. One of the things that we're looking at with home league ADPs is that they tend to be tethered to default ranks from different sites that are going to work off of projections and where yep. you see backs like a Jameer Gibbs and a Devon H hand who are in committees, they're not going to look as good when you work through the volume, because if you give them credit for their efficiency, you come out with projections that are all wonky, <laughs> right? So you want to consider guys like Gibbs and H Han. at the same time, there's no reason you can't take a Kyron Williams, someone that I have mentioned that in best ball and in high stakes is dramatically undervalued. Now, does dramatically undervalued mean guaranteed to be a hit? It doesn't because there is a backup and backups are a real thing that cause problems, which is one of the reasons why zero RB works. There also are injury considerations. Drafting these guys in a home league because they're good plays in a home league doesn't guarantee you success, but it does allow you to build a base that you can then build off of with all of those wide receiver selections you named. So a few other foundation picks that will probably work for you. Derrick Henry is old at this point. He probably doesn't have the ceiling you're looking for, but in, again, in a home league, when you're building that foundation, probably a viable pick. Travis Etienne is a strong pick. Kenneth Walker is a strong pick. James Cook is a viable pick. We've mentioned James Conner. James Conner, because of the age situation and because of the lack of straight line speed, is someone that I'm always a little bit leery of, but the peripherals were stunning last year, right? Anybody who's coming off of a fantastic season, anyone who is still one of the elite backs in the NFL, you build your home league team with a couple of those guys and then call them. There are so many names you could hit at the wide receiver position. Yeah, and it's again, you mentioned like there will be in these drafts, there'll be a version of the, the wide receiver cliff, but it's not going to be anything like people will be hearing us draft on on underdog, for example. It's going to happen multiple rounds later, in my opinion, in, in these particular drafts. And there's a huge amount of wide receivers, as Sean mentioned, that we're talking about, like you have to get at this particular point of the draft that will be going later. And even by me talking through, you know, the ADP, somebody else who me and Sean drafted before we started recording this on a draft that may come out before or after this show comes out, uh, Jaden Reed is somebody who the FFPC versus the Yahoo ADP 14 pick difference. So you get a round discount on somebody like him. Christian Watson, his teammate, going 23 picks after the FFPC ADP. So you're getting him basically two rounds after ADP. JSN going two rounds after ADP. Brian Thomas Jr., when you get into that rookie conversation again, going 20 picks after his ADP on the FFPC when you look across the Yahoo. And obviously, Sean mentioned his piece being with CBS um, ADP. It may be slightly different, but it's opening the door for you to be able to end the rounds where maybe you normally are like, right, this is a zero RB draft, and I'm going to take these guys at this point, and the wide receivers are kind of gone. Those wide receivers are all available at that point of your draft. So like Sean was saying, if you can have an early pick potentially, or even if you have a late pick, and you, you hinted there, Sean, at the way it might show up for the likes of a Jamar Gibbs. But like we talked about, Jamar Gibbs being a, a good pick at the one two turn and those you know higher stakes drafts. And you're in a situation here where you may get him in the mid to late second on some of those particular sites. So I think that that he becomes a very, very interesting pick. And then moving back throughout the the rest of the draft and getting those later wide receivers. I wouldn't be opposed, Sean, to, to starting off with two wide or two running backs, sorry, and these drafts the way that wide receivers sometimes fall. When I'm in the room, though, I tend to, it can be a difficult selection to pass up some of those wide receiver names as well and those opening two rounds that people may not be looking to draft. But depending on your draft slot, it is going to look a little bit different at the front or the back of those rooms. But I think the way it, it sets up gives you a lot of flexibility. And because of the information you may have been you know, digesting over the last couple of weeks or months, gives you a little bit of a, a leg up then to, to piece that roster together. I guess, Sean, something that we, we haven't talked about is like you get into the, the hero or uh, zero RB kind of build. You could go in to get two, as I mentioned. But the, the part I was going to mention then is I feel like in these home leagues, there is just, it's, it's, I would say it's almost too easy to just go with, you know, 
some combination of late round quarterbacks because of how far QBs outside of the elite options fall. And then I mentioned some of the kind of younger names. Like you're looking at somebody like a Bo Nix, who I think could, unless you're in a, a draft with a lot of Denver Broncos fans, you know, might might have a, a very late ADP. Do you think that attacking the elite quarterbacks has the same advantages in a a home league, or do you think looking to you know some of those those later guys is the way to play it and continue to add up on the running backs, wide receivers, and and even some of those tight end names? So quarterback, I think, is the controversial one. Tight end also arguably controversial. Uh, and I think tight end, though, you know, we talk about tight end being a extra position if you have two of those guys and you're you know playing in the FFPC. But when you're playing in your home league, I think that it is also a position that while the prices will be still cheaper, I think it's so, like elite tight end is not really, a, I think, a strategy that has <laughs> sank its way into a lot of home league drafters. So I think you can get an advantage at the position there. And you want to know what you're going for, because if touchdowns are the key, then a George Kittle is going to be an exciting play. The interesting thing there, though, is that Kittle, because of the name, and you talked about name recognition, he's someone who... Something is, as simple as Sean as a Netflix show that he appears in, I think, can like make people want to draft him. Like, my, my mom knows who George Kittle is, or something to that effect. <laughs> so Kittle, not as good a value in home leagues as he is in high stakes, where I would argue that he's undervalued. You had mentioned some names... Trey McBride, Dalton Kincaid, Kyle Pitts, those players appear to be very undervalued in home leagues. It doesn't mean that they're locked in hits, but the price differences compared to what high stakes drafters are doing are dramatic. And there is insight there, right? The people who are the most tuned in love these players. We like the players column, but beyond just our research-based intel on those guys the entire community is very firm in that stance you probably want to get one of those three tight ends and then add bowers and you will have tight end wrapped up at a discount qb is different and this is again where i think you want to really understand your format because the shallower the starting lineup the more important it is to go ahead and just get that star QB. If you're in a two running back, two wide receiver, one tight end, one flex league, and it's even possible that there are some leagues that are shallower than that. But if you were in that type of format, there simply aren't that many starters. And so your onesie positions really matter. If you gap your league and just don't have to worry about your QB, that's an extreme edge for you. So from time to time, people will joke about the QB ADPs in home leagues. And yet, even in the first round, a Josh Allen can make sense because you lock down that position, you get the big edge, you don't have to worry about it, and then you can outdraft everyone else from that point. The other thing that you have to know as you're trying to build these teams out is how much of an informational advantage are you going to have over your league mates? Because the bigger the advantage, the more conservative you can be early in terms of just filling out your starting lineup. If you have a huge informational advantage on the rest of the people in your group, I mean, just take Josh Allen, whatever the price is, add him to your roster. You'll be fine. The thing that I have noted and the reason that I have pushed back on even some of the articles that we've had out on the site talking about how we had elite QBs jump up in 2023 and then they didn't perform as well. So they fall back and now they're back into the range where they look like they're a good value in best ball. You think about the apex experts league, which definitely not a home league, but a 12 team league where you have a, two running back, three wide receiver, one flex lineup. And you think through if that, if those are your starting considerations, how would the best players in the world approach it? And Josh Allen went in round five. Patrick Mahomes, I believe went in round seven. CJ Stroud went in round nine. To me, 
that is again further confirmation that the QB1 tier is extremely deep. When we think about the second half of last season, Dak Prescott and Jordan Love were the two other QBs kind of in that range with a Josh Allen and a Lamar Jackson. And those players are generally going in that QB9, QB10. For Prescott, you're talking QB11, QB12. That means everyone in your draft is going to have a QB that can score a lot of points. If everyone in your draft is going to have a QB who scores, the advantage is minimized, and certainly it's minimized if the Bills become a run-based offense, if the Eagles don't have the quarterback sneaks, if Patrick Mahomes doesn't hit on one of his epic seasons, if the other pass-oriented QBs don't hit on their epic seasons, if the run-based QBs like an Anthony Richardson or a Jaden Daniels don't run hot on touchdowns and don't add a huge amount of passing value. You can think about it from kind of that Justin Fields dynamic where he rushed for a thousand yards and was a good fantasy quarterback, but not a league breaking fantasy quarterback because of the lack of additional pass volume. You do actually need to have both parts. If you want to separate like a Josh Allen, like a Jalen hurts, you look at the, offenses and the way that they are set up it's possible that richardson and daniels don't add the passing portion of it in which case again you're going to have a very flat qb1 tier so then for me as i work it back to how do you play a home league you want to go with your own preferences you don't want to take what we say you don't want to take what you hear from (laughs) uh, some famous fantasy fantasy expert You don't want to take ADP and say, okay, these people know what they're talking about. I've got to draft it in this way. You want to understand which QBs you like out of that group and whether your preference going through the season is to have one of the guys at the back end of that and then have better talent in the other part of your roster, or if you prefer the perceived safety and upside of a guy at the front end of it. I mean, in a home league, partly what you're doing is you're going to take the guys that you like and want to root for, right? So you have to decide that because the 2024 season offers you multiple paths. Colin, for me, it would be to take the guys at the back end of it. But again, depending on the informational advantage you have, you may not need to. I think that's a really good way to kind of summarize it up. I think, you know, you're talking about if we talk about tiers and um, where we would take certain players, I think the tiers kind of are almost elongated. Not that they're bigger tiers of players, but the range of where those players get drafted is, you know, stretched out between the rounds. So getting those players that little bit late, but still getting one of the, the higher end tier of QB makes a lot of sense there. Sean, I think that is a good way to summarize it up and kind of rather than just give all player takes or that just give an overall strategy view of what people can do in their home leagues i do think just wrapping it up sean's point on qb and getting one of those at the end of that tier but that can still be like technically that can be in round nine as you mentioned uh with some of the names going there i think the elite quarterbacks are going to give you an edge but again it is price dependent on where they go in your league which will be a lot different to some of the leagues that we have talked about and how we do it on the show and i think the young like the young players and the profiles that we're targeting across all those drafts are still the players i would be recommending to draft in all your home leagues but you do get into some of the the deeper rounds and if you have a shallow roster like sean mentioned some of the players that will have you know the injury concerns entering week one become very hard to, to roster throughout those opening weeks but is there anything else sean and and summary that you think are in those essentials that that people should do in their drafts yeah i think the final thing for me is that in your home league you can have your cake and eat it too which means in some ways actually being a little bit more cautious you don't want to be cautious to the point where you squeeze the upside out but we've talked a lot about all the values you can get on young players 
but you don't need to lean into that to the as much. Yeah, you don't need to lean into it to where you're taking unnecessary risk. There are such great values in rounds, say, 8 through 14, that in the first seven rounds, you can play it somewhat conservatively. Again, you take good players. You don't take Denzel players. You don't take old running backs who had poor peripherals last season. You don't take wide receivers who are names but don't give you upside. You don't take tight ends who are poor value for where they're going relative to other people. But there are lots of great picks in those first seven rounds that will allow you to get off to a good start to where you're not playing multiple rookies in week one and coming back three weeks in and trying to figure out why you're 0-3 and wondering if there's still a path to making it. There probably is a path. That team that you drafted that's 0-3 is probably still the best team for the remaining schedule and you probably will make the playoffs and you will be in the mix you've got a great chance to win but you can have your cake and eat it too by drafting players in the first seven rounds who will score in that first month and then you dominate rounds eight through 14 by kind of mapping out who are the road of his priority selections who are available in 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm going to add all of those players and then as the season develops I have this second wave that's going to come through and it's going to give me this elite upside because I have players taking the next step who, you know, we talk about it all the time, Column. The way that you win is you destroy your league during the buys. The home league will set it up for you so that you have that wave of young players to where everybody else is dropping off and you're actually finding a second gear. So let's go the second gear in the middle of the season to just crush the rest of your league mates. If you are drafting this weekend, enjoy your draft. Best wishes with it. Hopefully, for all our listeners, we recommend having a great season. That is the way we would recommend it, Sean, isn't it? Go and win those leagues. It feels much better at the end of the season. But the main thing is have fun in those draft rooms, have a good time, and obviously come back for more OT conversations throughout the season to keep those rosters in peak condition. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Over to Ireland. My co-host is Sean Siegel. I mentioned his articles up on rotaviz.com along with the rest of the team that is doing fantastic work. You can check those all up at rotaviz.com. If you are signing up and you haven't done so already, you can use that code RVRADIO2024 to get yourself a 10% discount. Get you access to all of the tools and content from now throughout the season. And until we are back, have a good one.